five by five point mule deer. Now, first of all, we call it a five by five, or in other words, a five point mule deer. Now, there's two different ways to count this. Eastern count, you count both sides. So, in other words, back east, this would be called a ten point. I got a ten point in Colorado. All right. However, out here in the west, we only count one side. One, two, three, four, five. So in other words, we would tell our friends, yeah, I got a five point the other day. Five by five in this case. Back east, we'd say, I got a ten point. Now, first of all, on all antlered or horned game, we should always start about five inches behind the shoulder blades of the animal, like this one here. Front legs, we're coming down here. We make a circular cut all the way around the animal. From there, we basically, until we get to the taxidermist, can just go ahead and tube it all the way forward and cut the head off, bring it in like this to the taxidermist. And this is pretty much about all you need to do. However, there's a lot of times when it's warm outside, <clears throat> or you're backpacking out, you need to cut down on weight. There's a multitude of circumstances. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. Now, first of all, when you go ahead and eviscerate it, in other words, field dress the animal, what you'd want to do is don't cut up into the brisket area. Now, you can see this one here was cut up a little bit. I didn't do this. This here's a customer's deer. However, other than that, he done quite well. First of all, when he came to the legs in the front, after he made the circular cut around the animal, behind the shoulder blades, not in front, behind the shoulder blades, because we need enough skin to tuck behind the form that we mount it on. This is very important. Many times in our studio, we receive capes that are cut too short, about four or five inches too short. Now what we have to do, we have to go in and alter our form, henceforth, more cost to the customer. So to keep your cost down, give us plenty. Give us way too much. That way we have nothing to gripe about. Okay? That's for sure. It's better to have too much than not enough. Now, other than, than this, uh, this customer done fairly well. Now, he didn't slit the throat, which is really great. There's no need to ever slit the throat of any big game animal. Because, trust me on this, once it's dead, and once you field dress it, you gut it, you eviscerate it, whatever, once you open it up, it's going to bleed all it's going to bleed. It's not going to bleed anymore if you cut the throat or anything like that. And also, if you do cut the throat for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, it's an old wives' tale. I know basically where it came from. We won't get into that right now. A little bit of folklore there. Uh, whenever you do cut the throat, what you do, you end up cutting all these hairs right here. And you will see a noticeable line when the taxidermist goes ahead and sews it back together. Also, too, when you do go ahead and gut a deer, eviscerate it, field dress it, several different ways to say it, start from the anus, go right up to the bottom of the solar plexus and stop there. Because basically right about there is where the brisket stop, uh, starts. Now, this person here went up about, about six to eight inches too far. However, this here will see it mount up with a minimal of repair. We probably got to repair two or three inches down here. It depends upon how large we can stretch the neck. We'll get into measurements in a few minutes. Now, backtrack a little bit. Circular cut all the way around the animal, about four to five inches behind the shoulder blades. Okay. From there, you pull the skin forward. You come to the front legs. Okay, what do I do? Well, if you don't want to do this yourself, just go ahead and cut the legs off at the knee joint, each one. Go ahead and invert that skin. In other words, turn it inside out like a glove or a sock or something of that nature. Keep pulling that skin forward, skin it, use your knife where it's needed, okay? And then cut the head off and bring it in like this. The taxidermist will take care of it. We don't charge any extra for skinning out the head. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we prefer to skin the head out. We prefer to get the skin 
the head like this. That way we can go ahead and skin it out and if we make any mistakes it's our fault. It's not your fault. However, there's a lot of times you can't do that. If you're backpacking in, you're way back in there, weight is very, very important. So you want to do the best job you can. <clears throat> now, first of all, let's talk about a few measurements. Most important and critical measurements that a taxidermist needs, and it's not always necessary to get them on the live deer. Now, a lot of times, oh, it's great, it's nice, but what we're concerned with is the finished product. If you want to go ahead and take some measurements, the most important ones are, number one, N to E, that's nose to eye measurements. From the tip of the nose to the corner of the eye, beginning of the eye, right here. Get this position correctly. Right there, corner of the eye. Now we're on the inch scale. This is the metric scale. We're going with the English measuring scale here. Corner of the eye, right here, seven and a quarter inches. Seven and a quarter inches is what this deer measures. Now, the second measurement is the circumference of the neck, about two inches, two to three inches in back of the ears. Let's go ahead and measure that. We don't have to really be this specific because what we do, we split it down, open it up, measure it that way, but we'll just see. About two to three inches. About, about right about there, about two inches. Okay, what we need to do is measure that. Now, you don't measure this with the skin on, with the hair on, etc. We have to go ahead and open this skin, lay the skin out flat and measure that because if we do it now, we're going to get a false reading. There's a lot of tax numbers that say, well, and go ahead and pull the tape real, real tight. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't really work that way. Everybody's got their own technique. You do whatever's best for you. However, I am showing you the correct methods. First of all, again, this customer done a fairly decent job. So I really can't complain about this too much. He didn't slit the throat. It's not messed up. It's not blood soaked, which is very important. On any game head that you want to get mounted, on any species, on any specimen you want to get mounted, you want to take to a taxidermist, please do your best to keep it as cool as possible. If you can't get into a taxidermist for a while, but you're back at home, you're taking care of family business, you've got to go to work or whatever, try to freeze the specimen as soon as possible. If you get it frozen solid, it'll last almost indefinitely if it's protected from the cold air in a freezer. Now, there's a couple of misnomers. A lot of people tell me, well, Kim, I went ahead and I uh, caked out the animal and done a pretty good job and I went ahead and salted it and I threw it in the freezer. Well, why did you throw it in the freezer? You can't salt something and throw it in the freezer and expect it to freeze. You can't do it got to wash the salt back off. Salt takes away the purity of ice and it will not allow anything to freeze unless it's super, super cold, real low temperature, and none of us have two or three thousand dollar refrigerator, or I should say freezer, that could do that job. We're not NASA, we don't have that type of equipment. But you cannot salt something and then later freeze it. It does not work that way. There's been a lot of people I know they salt something, they throw it in the freezer, because they have a big chest freezer. Some people I know has got a walk-in freezer. They throw it in there, they come back about a month later, because they have a big businessman, whatever the situation may be, and says, hey, Kim, yeah, here's this deer here, it smells a little funny, and he just, like, two or three miles away from the shop here, and uh, I said, well, there's a problem here, it's rotten. He goes, well, how could that be? That was in my freezer. Well, the reason is because it never froze solid. To stop bacteria growth, you must keep it frozen solid, and that's very, very cold. Uh, 32 degrees is both freezing and thawing. Usually keep your freezer right on zero, and that will keep it frozen solid. But again, it must not be salted. Now, what we're going to do here on mule deer, elk, caribou, moose, any other antlered game, or horn game. Right here, the center. 
center of the spine, the backbone. Now, on mule deer, there's usually a black line, okay? But you follow the center of this line down, and you split this skin. In other words, it's like taking a shirt off from reverse. In other words, like a straight jacket. It's a heck of a thing to say, isn't it? But you take a shirt off from reverse. So you want to split this skin. Now, when you go to split this skin, you want to be fairly careful that you don't cut the underlying skin, okay? Now, if this here is actually on the animal, it can work out a lot better because instead of tubing it all the way forward, you can actually go ahead and split this skin, bring it out, and it actually help facilitate the skinning of this animal. Matter of fact, in the field, uh, you can probably do this here in about 10 minutes. In the field, if you're really moving, you can really do it really quick. Get out. Now, first of all, I'd like to show you something here. You don't need a big knife to begin this process, okay? You really don't. It's not necessary to get one of these great big Bowie knives or fighting knives, chopping wood knives, chainsaw knives, whatever you want to call it. You don't need a knife that big. You can get by with a small pocket knife. Just keep it real sharp. I'd normally use this one, but this knife, unfortunately, is not sharp anymore. I skinned out four elk and five deer today already with it. It's a little dull. I need to touch it back up. So what I'm going to use right now is a scalpel and razor blades. Surgical scalpel. And uh, what we need to concentrate on here really is keeping your knife sharp and the proper technique and use of the knife. Number one, whenever you use a knife, scalpel, or other sharp instrument, number one, you never want to bring it towards you. You always want to push away from you. And if it's sharp, chances are it won't cut you. The reason being is because it's the dull knife that cuts you. A lot of people say, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, the reason why it doesn't make sense is because if it's dull, you have to push extra hard. You're more apt to split, slip, or cut something, or your finger, or your hand. And it can cause a pretty nasty gash, especially razor blades. Now, on any species like this here, it doesn't make any difference what it is, as long as it's in the animal world. Even though there are a lot of humans like this, I guess, from what I understand reading the paper and watching the local news, uh, you might want to consider wearing some gloves. The reason why this is because if you got any cuts or sores or you bite your fingernails, pull them off, got a hangnail, and you pull one out or something, you're going to have some open wounds on there. And if your blood or your bodily fluids mixes with the bodily fluids of this animal or species, if it's got the bubonic plague or any other disease, guess what? Bingo, you just might get it. Also, too, you might want to protect yourself uh, from any biting ticks and things of this nature and just basically kind of watch the animal, make sure it doesn't have any lice or other disease organisms on it. Now, I usually, now, I tell you this advice, but a lot of times it's kind of hard for me to remember because I'm always in such a hurry to do something. Um, a lot of times I skin these animals out without my gloves. My wife's always telling me, hey, get some gloves on. And that's common sense. She's got a lot of good common sense. She's got to remind me from time to time, and I love her dearly for that. And what we need to do, we're going to start up here at the top. We're going to bring the knife blade down and follow this line. Now, Notice the way I'm holding my knife. Okay, again, this here is a scalpel. All knife blades are the same. Go ahead and pull this one here back out. You want to hold it up with the edge up because when the edge starts going down, what do you do? You cut the outlying hair and that will show. So we want to avoid that. It's not a very sharp knife, so we'll put that over there. Put our ruler over here. So what I'm going to do Again, let's try to get this here straightened up. Let's start right back up in here. Now what we want to do, make this cut down here. Now there's several ways you can do this. You can go ahead and make a T straight across from antler burr to antler burr. Or you can make a 7 where it comes straight across and then down here to the original straight cut. Or you can make a V, whatever your fancy. There are several different ways to cut it. I just prefer to go ahead and cut a T. Sometimes I may cut a 7. 
but the idea of it is try to do it neatly, quickly, and we'll be on our way. Now, before I even cut this here, what I like to do, I like to go ahead and run this line down here and open this. Now, some taxidermists, they don't do this. They'll make, oh, maybe about a 12-inch incision here, and they won't cut the rest of this. That way, then they can go ahead and take their time and skin off all the rest of the head, and they only have about one foot of sewing to do. Well, that's nice, but time's a factor, quality's a factor, and I would much rather go ahead and split this open the entire length. That way, when I take it across our big fleshing machines, I can go ahead and thin the skin a lot easier, a lot more proficiently, and turn out a better quality mount. It's just that one thing about it, unfortunately, uh, I hate to sew. I'm a taxidermist. I'm in the wrong profession if I hate to sew. However, it's necessary to do a good job on sewing, and I get a lot of experience. My wife does too, let me tell you. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go ahead and start right up in here, split this skin open. Now this knife's sharp, and uh, don't be surprised if I break off a blade. Something else here when I put a little bit of pressure on it, because look, now a deer skin can become quite thick. Elk skin can be upwards of a half inch thick, or even thicker. You bet. And these old bulls and bucks, big high timber bulls and bucks. And what we'll do, we'll go ahead and brace this up right here. Now, I have a tarp down here on this table. It's protecting this nose. What I usually do is ring them first, and I'll show you that in just a moment. The main thing I want to do right now is open this up and show you that shirt that I was talking about. What I'll do, I'll follow this. Take my time. There's that line right here. I'm going to try and keep that straight as possible. If you get a little off center, it's no big deal. But you don't want to start weaving down in through here. That'll make your taxidermist very upset. And if you're my customer, I don't know. I may snicker, may say something, may tell you to take it down the road, but I'm a pretty nice guy. See, i got to put a little bit of pressure on there. I'm pulling those antlers up. What I'm going to do is keep that coming. The thing about these surgical blades is, oh yeah, they're sharp, but shoot, they dull pretty quick. We buy about $1,000 worth of blades every year. But I tell you what, when it comes to cutting and fleshing and thinning the skin, you can't ask for a better instrument. However, again, what one way I tell you to do something, there's probably about 50 other ways out there to do it. So you do whatever works best for you. Most people just get a good knife and keep their knife sharp and you won't have a problem. Now I'm taking my time through here. I'm not rushing because I'm trying to demonstrate something. Otherwise I'd rush right through this and be open real quick. But I'm not here to show off. I'm here to hopefully maybe teach you something right there. A little bit of coagulated blood. Now. See how this opens up? This opens up real well. That's what we want. We want this skin, again, followed along the center of the backbone where it opens up like a skin. Like a nice flat skin, like a shirt that's put on backwards, of course. Okay. Now, right before we jump up to the front facial features, let's talk about this leg. All right, now, this is that one leg I was telling you about. Now, the proper way to split these legs, this is where everybody makes mistakes, right here. Okay? What they'll do is they'll cut to the inside. You don't cut to the inside. You make a circular cut all the way around the animal. You pull in the skin. Okay, let's say you've gone ahead and you've opened up your shirt now. This is your shirt. We just call it your shirt. You opened it up. The cape. You opened it up. It's coming down. Here's the legs. Oh, gee, what did I do? went ahead and I cut, cut it off the knee. I inverted the skin. But really, all you need to do is cut it directly down the back edge of the leg. Right where the short hair is coming up to the back of the leg.
This here is the back of the leg, right there. There's the front, because it would be like this, the underarms, pit area. Now what I'll do, it's good to have my wife help me, but she's on the camera today. It's always good to have four or five or six other hands here helping you tighten the skin and do this and do that. And it's a lot better if you go ahead and leave it on the leg, cut it down the, the back, out to that circular cut, because what does that do then? That goes ahead and opens up all this, because all this has got to be opened up. Now, a lot of this here, I'll be cutting away on the back of the form once this skin's fully tanned and prepped and ready to be mounted. But I need this extra skin, because if I can stretch that neck a little bit bigger, give you a bigger neck for your deer, you see, when you stretch this way, it takes up room this way. Now, you can only stretch your skin so far, so it doesn't make any difference what you do. But it's always good to have more than enough skin. So I'll go ahead and stick the knife in here. Just get stick it together a little bit. And I'll split this skin right down here along that edge. And it does help, again, to have a good, sharp knife. Now this here is a scalpel, and I'm just taking my time and coming up here. Uh, I know if you got a real sharp knife, you can just stick it up there and zzz. Just zip it open like a zipper. Well, I'm going to take my time here. I'm not going to worry about making and racing anyone because I want to do the job. Now, on any of these animals, when I mentioned a little bit earlier, and I got sidetracked as usual, uh, a lot of ticks are on them. You've got to be careful. Rocky Mountain Spotted Tick Fever, or, oh geez, Wine Tick Disease, there's a bunch of them. A lot of people. Now, mainly back east is where you get this. I want to just keep going up here. Just keep to that edge, you'll do fine. See how that opens up? Opens up very nice. We've got that entire armpit there. Go ahead and mount that deer. And that deer will come underneath the brisket area. I see this one here. See that? That's what we're looking for right there. See now again, I got to go ahead and sew that part. But we want that to show because a lot of people, when they cut to the inside, they'll cut all that up and we've got to stitch it up. We've got to charge you extra for the repair. We usually got a little bit of repair time already built into the price, but if it comes up real bad, and I've seen people bring us deer, great big monster bucks, I'm talking 30 inch plus, 32 inch plus bucks come in, great big thick massive beams, and I'm going, gee, where'd you guys get these? This is beautiful, great, congratulations. Then I pick up the cape and it split right down the center of the front of the cape. It's incredible. I'm going, oh, no, no. And they go, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I go ahead and I tell them what's the matter. And, geez, I'm talking about monster-sized capes, and they're almost ruined. Henceforth, we got to spend an extra four or five hours for repair, proper repair. Anyway, doesn't make the hunter too happy when he messes up. So now, I think we pretty much got that down, how we open that up. Now, Let's talk about the ringing. What I'm talking about the ringing is, it helps facilitate the skinning of the face. Now, if you want to, just stop right now and bring this into the taxidermist. If you can't bring it in, freeze it solid. Okay, but what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and cover the other techniques that we can do. Now, there are certain techniques I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with. Uh, such as turning the ears inside out, splitting the nose and the lips, the inner eyelids, and other things, because that's a little bit too technical. And I would hate to have someone make a mistake now at that particular junction in time, because then that would almost ruin the cape. So what we've got to do now is basically get ready to either A, be taken to the taxidermist, or B, be frozen. Now, if you don't have the room to put this big thing here, in your freezer 
Well, how can you get it in there? Geez, you can't get to the taxidermist. You've got your life to continue. Uh, well, we need to take the skin off here. That's what we're going to do. We're going to take it off here. I'm going to show you the proper way to take the antlers off. And then you can take the skin just the way it is, roll it up, put it in a plastic bag, and freeze it solid in the freezer. Won't be no problem. Provided, of course, you didn't salt it. Alright, let's get back to the ringing. Ringing I'm talking about is, you go ahead and you actually take your knife and you work it up among the gum line, the upper palate. You can see, incidentally, if you don't already know this, uh, deer don't have any teeth in their upper palate. It's more like a gum line there. For grabbing and crunching the grass and whatever else they like to eat brows, tree limbs, and everything. They munch that down there and grab a hold of it and start chewing, almost like a cow chewing their cud. What I'm doing here, I'm just bringing my knife up. See, I'm bringing it up now. Again, I want to pay attention that I don't cut through the skin. So I keep my knife blade kind of towards the bone area. Okay, so I'm cutting the skin loose in there. Again, I want to be careful, so I don't do that. Now, what I'm doing here, you got the nose cartilage. Now I'll come over here and do this side. And what I'm going to do here now, you got to be careful. Right here, you got to be real careful. Simply because if you mess up here, you're going to have a great big slice right up in there. So you want to be real careful. What I'm trying to do now is work this nose loose. Not loose from the skin, mind you, because that's all got to stay connected. Work it loose from the cartilage around here. I notice too how my knife is always at about a, oh, anywhere from a 22 to a 30 degree slant on the skin. Depends. Sometimes you've got to bear down a little bit. It's starting to get a little dull. Just this little bit of cutting. A little bit of cutting started to dull this thing already. But I'll tell you what, again, these scalpels are nice. But they're expensive, and I guess good tools cost money. I know they cost money. We've got a lot of good tools. Anyway, I want to say thank you for renting this tape purchasing this tape. Hopefully you purchase it, right? That'll work out. But uh, this here is something you can watch again and again. Now, notice what I've done here. I didn't cut through the nostrils or any part of the skin. Notice how thick that is. See, now later on, what I'll do, I'll go ahead and I'll split this, thin all that down. In other words, this here will actually fold out like that. This here will actually fold out after I split it and thin it and uh, it'll really work out really well. But that's a little bit too complicated of a course to get into because again, I would hate to have you or someone else you know that doesn't know the absolute proper technique with experience, by the way. Get into your number one record book, deer, elk, moose, caribou, what have you, and make a mistake, cut a lip off, cut a nose off, all because you're going so well, well, you'd be pretty upset at me, wouldn't you? So I'm just basically showing you a technique here that you can use on any animal, and then take it into the taxidermist and let him or her worry about it. And usually if you're a taxidermy shop, you've got several people working for you, so just let them worry about it. Now, on the bottom lip, it's basically the same thing. You cut in towards the bone, leave all that lip on there. Don't take your time. There's no need to hurry on this. Now, again, I could do this whole thing in uh, all 10 minutes if I'm in a hurry and paying attention to what I'm doing. But make no mistake, no matter how good you are, no matter how good you think you are, we all make mistakes. It's just a fact of life, and it's something we all need to work with. 
practice, practice, practice. Nobody can do anything perfect overnight, and even the people that's been doing it 50, 60, 75 years or longer, they make mistakes too. Don't let them fool you. We all make mistakes. And what I'm doing again now, see, I'm basically skinning this down a little bit off here because it's going to be a lot easier when I start skinning up here and bringing this down. Because what we're going to have to do is dig out the tear ducts, stick your finger in here in the eyes, we pull the skin down from around the antlers, from the antler burrs, very important. See, this is what we're doing here. See that? You can see all that. We need to get down there. Now, what I'll do, I'll go ahead and change blades here. Try to keep a sharp blade in there. And a lot of times I break these blades too when I'm cutting them and fleshing them down and thinning them. Now, we have other tools and techniques to use. Now here, since I've already done that, I can just pull that up, not worry about really tearing any flesh off the nose. The antler is going to go ahead and support it. Now here, since this one here was cut up pretty high, there's a lot of times we get deer in here, they got like a foot and a half of meat left on there, 30 or 40 pounds of meat. Deer and elk, I tell you, there's a lot of good eating there in the neck, not this particular one, because they took most all the meat off. So This in here is good for for the dog out back, old Comet. What I'm doing here now, I'm trying to pare this skin away from here so I can get up in here and facilitate this because I'm going to have to pull the skin out. When I get down to the earbud, i got to cut that off next to the skull. There's a lot of taxidermists that are really big on, yeah, you can stick your finger in my mounts, in the ears of my mounts, and you can feel that ear butt and all of that, well that's not really important. I want the deer to look like a deer. I want the deer to look like it did before I shot it. I want it to look almost alive. I want it to look alive. But we do the best job we can as taxidermists. And this is 1994, October, that I'm making this tape right here. And uh, I'll tell you, the taxidermy industry, the last uh, five to ten years has went through such a dramatic change. It's incredible. We have forms now that are so anatomically correct, it's just hard to make a mistake. Where the work really is, is in the grub work. That's where the secret is. You've got to do this right. Once you got the skin, you got to flesh it down properly, you got to thin the skin, you got to tan it properly. We use only professionally tanned skins in our studio and we professionally tan them ourselves. We have our own tannery. We maintain full control of your trophy at all times. That way there's no excuses. Oh, sir, I'm sorry, but the tannery split out your ear. It done $200 worth of damage. We gotta replace this, we gotta replace that. There's big hair slippage problem. See, we don't have those problems. Although I'd like to make a little note here that a lot of times when it comes to hair slippage, there's nothing the taxidermist can do about it because there's a couple problems here. Number one, was the animal a disease? Did it have a problem? Was it healthy? What were the weather conditions? Was it really hot when you got this animal? Because putrefaction and deterioration starts right away at the moment of death. That's why you got to get this thing cool and cold as possible, as quickly as possible, to help stop that. I, henceforth, that's the reason why you skin the animal so quick. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration. But like I said, 1994, we have chemicals and techniques today that is absolutely incredible. Now here, I'm coming to the earbud, right here. Coming down in here. I don't want to get way up in here because this is riding too high. Let's flip the skin over and I'll show you. See that? That's too high. I want to get further down in here. 
And right here is the earbud. We're going to cut through that. See that? I cut down there real low. Now, I'm being careful with my knife. Notice where the skin's at. Notice too how I'm going at a carving like action. You know, this ear is basically free from the skull. And here we got some more meat and muscle. I cut down this way. Do the same thing over here. Okay. Now what I want to do here is decide what I want to do. I'm just going to do the T. It's a little bit easier. If your T is a little bit crooked, no problem. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and cut from here over to here, from here over to here. Okay. Now a lot of people say, well, go ahead and dig it out from here and start over there. It doesn't make any difference. Just try not to cut the hair. Okay, it's, it's hard to do, you're going to cut a little bit of hair. Then we're going to work the hair out from around the outer burst. You use a screwdriver, you use a sharp knife, you use muscle ease, whatever you can. You work this skin out from around here. Take your time. Again, there's no need to hurry. Because if you worked hard for it, and if it's good enough to take to a taxidermist, take your time, you'll do fine. Don't rush it. It's going to be a little awkward for me because I'm going to try and do this in a way that everybody can see. So what I'm going to do here is get some of the skin loose. I'm going to try to skin up in here a little bit. Again, it's kind of awkward for me because I'm trying to make it where everybody can see. Keep the gloves on. But always try to keep those gloves on. It's not necessary. Well, it is necessary, but... Uh, Sometimes I feel that they're just more problem what they're worth, but then again, too, I've never had bubonic plague, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tick fever, and a host of other diseases, so I guess I've been pretty lucky and fortunate. Some people I know have, so I guess I can't really argue too much because something's working right. So what I'm going to do here, since I'm over here, I'm going to cut down now. I'm going to end up cutting a little bit of this hair, but that's not really going to matter that much. Okay, because I got more than enough there to cover it back up. And now it's a different story if I start leaving chunks of meat, flesh out around here. But just going to be a little bit of this here, not a lot, just a little. I'm already down here at the antler burr. See how thick that hair is? The skin hangs on very, very tight. That'd be is use your knife, use your skin, get the skin work loose around there, up underneath the burr. Use your knife where it's needed, work the point down in there, and actually pull that skin back from around there. That's what we're working for. Now we're starting to get back to the backer part, the back part rather. So it's where the backer, but the back part. this burr, keep pulling the skin, and then obviously the portion right there where the earbud was is going to be a little tight and you're going to have some other connecting tissue. Go ahead and use your knife there as needed and separate that. That way it'll work a lot better. I'm doing it this way. I know you can't really see it right now, but uh, I'm just trying to get things going here. But again, take your time. Follow the outline of the skin, keeping close to the bone, to the skull itself. Don't be cutting into the skin. Keep the blade at the right angle to it. Okay. As you can see, look what I'm doing here. Right there. Right there. See that, how that skin goes around there? I'm actually pulling that skin around. Okay, I'm actually cutting and pulling. Now, you want to be careful that you don't pull and split the skin here down to the eye socket. Okay, so again, you just got to take your time. You get this coming down, that's working good, then you can start on this side. But what I need to do right now is go ahead and cut this other side over. Incidentally, you can see how good these gloves are. I've already cut this one open. So what I'll do 
get another pair of gloves. I'm back. Went ahead and had to get another pair. Because I got to do what I say, right? Not you do what I tell you to do, then I'll do it a different way. No, I got to do it the same way. But I got to admit, sometimes these gloves are a lot of trouble. But if they keep me from getting sick, or anyone else that uses them from getting sick, well, I guess they're, they're worth it, aren't they? They cut that over to that burr. Very important. Cut that over to that burr. Get that skin worked out. And I can talk while I work. Keep you interested in a few things. Here we're coming to this flap here. Now notice, I didn't bring this cut way forward. Some people try to bring it way up in here. Don't do that. It's better to keep the cut and the subsequent stitches that will result when we're getting ready to go ahead and mount it, keep that towards back here to this part. Don't keep it to the front. That's why we're cutting back in here, not way up in here. I notice this part here. It's all working really nice. Again, use that knife as it's needed. Once you get the skin started, it, it pretty pretty well builds pretty quick. Sometimes you leave a little bit of little bit of hair up underneath there. It just means you didn't get the knife quite all the way up in there. It's important to, to dig that out as much as you can and get that all that hair on the skin. Try not to leave any hair under the antler burr, but being honest with you, it doesn't always happen that way. Then a lot of times, sometimes Go ahead and apply a little bit of pressure and see if it'll work. Yeah, working there a little bit. I'm going to rip my glove open again. Go ahead and use your knife. Again, we're not in a hurry here. We're trying to do something right the first time. Not come back and say, Mr. Taxidermist. Hello. Hi, look at this nice deer. Oh, that's real fine. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to have to charge you extra for this repair job here. Really? Yeah, just take your time. I don't know, someone told me something once and half my problem is I'm left-handed. That could be my problem. Did you notice that? Film there? But at least us left-handed people are in our right minds. I guess we can say that. I know enough jokes about right-handed people, right? So, okay. But just use your knife as it's needed. When it comes to the front part there, you can see how that flap start to come up? Now this tissue really sometimes gets on there really, really tight. That's why you don't want to let this lay around. Again, we touched on this earlier. You don't want to let this lay around or near any source of heat or sunshine or warm weather. You want to get this either skinned right away or frozen right away or preferably both. Now there's other techniques. Once we get the skinned off, you can salt it heavily. That will work too. And then get it into the taxidermist. Don't try to freeze it unless you wash off the salt. When we talk about salt, I'm talking about hay and stock salt. The same type of salt that you have on your dinner table. The only difference is it's non-iodized. The reason why they want non-iodized salt, doesn't have any iodine in it, is because sometimes, well actually there's two reasons. Number one is because it could discolor the skin of the animal when it goes through some other chemical tanning processes and things of this nature. And number two, sometimes at the factory that iodized salt gives off poisonous gases, but you know, you're not there so I guess you don't have to worry about it. But, you never want to use rock salt. Use that, it's not necessarily fine salt, but it's the same grain, same grind that you have right there on your dinner table. Look at that grain of salt that you have there. That grind. That's the same type of salt you want to use. You can go down to the uh, feed store 
can get a 50 pound bag of salt right now, 1994 October, uh, $4. You can probably get a little bit cheaper, or a little bit more inexpensive I should say, if you search around. There are certain places around the country, I guess they're already paying 7 or $8 for a 50 pound bag of salt. 50 pound bag of salt will, will last you a long time. Now, how much salt do you put on? You can never put enough salt on your skins. You can bury them in salt. It still won't be too much. Put all the salt you can on. Now, usually it's a pound of salt per pound of hide. The average deer cake weighs, uh, well, if you skin it out right, you don't leave great big chunks of flesh on it and stuff, probably about five or six pounds. So you're looking at five or six pounds of salt for the average deer cake. Elk cake. Well, you're looking at anywhere from 10 pounds for a small elk to 15 to 20 pounds. And a lot of people say, geez, that's a lot of salt. But to tell you the truth, it's not. Because you cannot over salt. Now, this is what I've done here so far. Now, you notice how the skin has actually been pried and cut away from around here. Got a little bit of hair right here. That's just a little bit. You always want to try to dig all that out. But you can see how thin this is, how that's been cut away from around there. Further use your knife, bring it around, cut away any meat, fibrous tissue. Remember, keep your knife toward, turned in towards the head, not outward. Okay, use your knife. Now again, you don't need a scalpel. It's just something I got here, it's handy. My other knife, I wore it out today. <laughs> Skinned out some good animals. Had some nice 6 by 6s come in today. We're in the first season, 1994. You come around here now. Notice how that skin again, the earbud and everything, right there. Remember we were cutting that away. Said again, just take your time. Oh, yeah. Now you start coming around to the top of the eye. Okay, now here's some skin here that's hanging on, flesh, I should say. Keep that knife turned down there. Start getting into that eye orbit. We'll be uh, talking about that in just a second. Get this part closed. Again, you notice that skin stays on in real time. Okay, now, what we have to do, we have to dig out these tear ducts. Deer and elk, caribou, have tear ducts. Now, what we have to do is go ahead and dig this out. As we come down here, got to be real careful. You don't want to make a mistake and actually cut this eyelid off. If you do, I tell you, that's difficult to repair. It can be repaired, but it's very difficult. And if it's not cut too bad, we can probably repair it. But it's time consuming because we got to make it look like a live animal. And to do that, you got to have all of the pieces there. If it's cut up and you got stitch marks, you got epoxy here, you got epoxy there, you try to blend it in, but the very observant person will notice that, hey, something's out of, out of whack here. What did you do? What happened? Okay, so take your time. What you do to prevent this, because you're going to cut your finger first if you make a mistake, stick your finger inside there. See that eyelid? Stick your finger in there, pull the skin back here, that way, if you go to cut down into the eyelid, before you get to the eyelid, you're going to cut your finger, and believe me, that will get your attention. That will do it. So what I'm going to do here, slice this down around this eye orbit, get in there, get this started. Okay, again, now I've got my finger in there. If I cut it, blood starts squirting out, I guess I've just taught everybody a good lesson there, haven't I? Be careful. I had to pull my finger out there for a minute. I had to put some more pressure on that skin. 
Now it's kind of hard just to skim down one side. As you come down here several inches, you got to roll it back over and do here. Otherwise, the skin gets kind of cockeyed here, counter crooked, and it gets real tight. So that's basically what we've got to do here is take our time, do the job right. And I do stress that, I've said that many times already in this tape, but it's important because too many people today get in a hurry and they make mistakes, but gee, you know, it was a perfect trip, everything went just great. I got in a hurry and look what I did. Gosh, I can't, man, I'll never get another deer like that. Man, where I just paid a big game guy $2,000, an outfitter whatever, to go hunting, and you decided, well, you're going to skin your own animal, or the guide does it, the guide doesn't know, and I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of guides and outfitters out there, and I know I'm going to make a lot of people upset by saying this, but they don't know how to properly skin and cape a big game animal. I know, I've had their work right here in this studio, you bet. Then I met other people, they do know, but a lot of times they get sloppy and lazy because they've already got your money. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not coming down on guides and outfitters. Everybody makes a mistake. But when someone's paying me that type of money, well, buddy, he's going to get part of blanche. He's got all the attention he's going to need. Now, where's my finger? Right there. Now we've got to be careful as we come around here. Again, this is kind of awkward, so hopefully you can see pretty good here lower portion of the eye. See, and this hair is so loose. Now, again, see, here's the eye. I want to make sure I don't nick that corner. So what i got to do is cut very close to this orbit. Get this cut. Then you'll see the skin start to pull away. See that right there? Now, right here is the tear duct. What you do on this side is the mirror image. What you got to do on this side. So pull this out. Now, cut deep down in there. Now, once you cut deep in there, if you cut off a little bit of the tear duct deep in there, it doesn't make any difference because the taxidermist has got to tuck it anyway. But you don't want to cut it off level. I've had a lot of those come in from professional guides. They were cut level. There wasn't any tear duct left. It was just level with the hair. It was almost ruined. And I mean almost simply because the rest of the cake was bad too, but we won't get into those specific things. So what I'm doing here now, I'm, I'm cutting off a little bit of that because I've already got down in there. And you see now, when a mule deer goes into the rut, their necks will swell huge. About as big as a whitetail. Last year we mounted over a hundred mule deer bucks that had neck circumferences of 26 inches. That's a big buck, let me tell you. And it's hard to believe for some of you other taxidermists that are watching this or experienced people, but you bet. Over a hundred deer that had 26 inch necks. That's a huge deer. Because during the rut, their nose, believe it or not, their face will shorten up a little bit. It will swell out here. And a lot of times, the tear duct that actually goes down in here will actually almost be level straight across because it's swollen so much. Then your neck comes way out here. It's just incredible, some of the big deer. Everybody thinks whitetail hunting so great, which it is. Whitetail hunting is good. But mule deer hunting, let me tell you something. you got to get out and work for these puppies. Now, some of them are easy. A lot of times you run across those people that stay in camp all day and they get the only animal. They get the biggest one. Now, looky how far we'll come here. Skin. Plenty of tear duct there to tuck down. Didn't make any nicks in the eye. Now we've got to do this to the other side. We're almost done here as far as this goes. Yep, that's one thing. If you're paying for a hunt, what you need to do is quiz the people that's taking out hunting. Hey, you going to skin it out for me? And they say, well, sure. That price includes all the skin in it. Boxing of the meat. Okay. Well, go ahead and ask them. Well, how do you, uh, why don't you explain to me in your own words, how do you cape a deer? How do you cape an elk? How do you cape that animal? How are you going to cape it since I'm paying for it? 
And I think you'll find out after watching this tape and talking to the uh, person that you're going to book a hunt with that there's some of them know what they're talking about, and some of them don't. But again, it's your money. You want to spend it wisely or spend it foolishly? That's up to you. I'm just trying to help you out here. Now here, they actually cut into the eyeball, not the eyelid or anything, but the eyeball. It doesn't make any difference. Just sometimes this uh, skin is kind of difficult to get a cut on and stuff because it's so gooey. You want to use that word gooey. Dig this one out. And we're coming down here to the tear duct. Dig this one out. Cut that right there. No problem. And tear duct. As we're coming down now, remember what we've done to the front of the deer? Now granted, if this is a six-point bull elk, you're going to be pretty doggone tired right now. We'll kick back, take a few minutes. Incidentally, again, don't be doing this in the sun. Do it in a shady area. If you're worried about bugs and stuff, if it is warm out, which a lot of times it is in the early seasons, well, what you can bring along is some black pepper. Sprinkle black pepper all over the place. However, there's a lot of flies and bugs out there that don't know this. They don't pay attention to it. But hopefully it helps. It helps season everything. Uh, on the cape itself, once the cape is away from the meat, you can go ahead and apply bug spray. There's a numerous, there's all kinds of things you can use. You can use flea and tick powder, all kinds of things. You'd be surprised what a, what a guy can do if he's innovative and thinks about it. Try to plan out your hunt very well, and you won't have no problem. Now, as we're coming down here, remember what we did in the ring? We're getting real close here until I can pop that, pull this skin down, cut off everything. Just about done. Notice how I'm pulling here. Just barely putting my knife blade on here. Over here we've got some more fibrous tissue, tendons. Now, well we're basically down there. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, see what I've done now? Remember? I went ahead and I ringed it. Coming down here, pull that down. Okay, now, remember those lips I cut around on the inside when I read it? Now here, again, this is awkward for me because I'm trying to make it where you can see it. Cut them off right like that. Now you gotta be careful now because there's still some skin. Now we've got all the lips. Shoot, we've got all the lips here. More than enough lips. Now down here you gotta be real careful. Because look, right here, the lower part of that skin, this is very, very thin skin. Very, very thin. So we gotta be careful here we don't cut through there. If you do, well just take a moment, step back, take a deep breath because we can repair it. But just don't continue cutting. It'll make the cut worse. Like I said, basic cuts, slices, we can repair. We don't charge you for that. It's those major babies we charge you for. Because sometimes uh, you may have to actually replace the cape if it's too bad. Now notice here what I'm doing. Now again, you're not going to be doing this with no 6x6 six six bull elk. It's just too heavy. Unless you've got two or three people to help you. Now notice now how all of this skin's coming down. We ringed around. We skinned down the back. Now we just got to go ahead and make skin and follow the outline of the skin. The outline of the skin. Keep your knife blade turned away from the skin, but at the proper angle so it cuts. And as you can see, we're done. Looky here. This, now look at this now, skinned out. And we've got a lot of the cartilage we took off there because we ringed it first. Now this is very important. Now notice how we cut this. Remember the antlers go around there. The eyes, T 
tear duct, got a little hole in it, doesn't make any difference, all this has got to be split, this is actually tucked down into the form. The nose, look how wide I can make this, look at it. That's a heck of a deer, that is a heck of a deer. Got all the lips, let's see what this looks like this way. Notice this, remember I was talking about that earlier? Oh yeah, it's not split up. This customer here cut this up, like I said, about approximately six inches too far. But we've still got enough there we can repair that. You can't even tell where the seam's at. <clears throat> now you got this off. Now remember the two measurements? What's the two measurements? Very important measurements. Now this is a big deer, I can tell you this right now. Just by looking at it. Number one, look at the face. The face is huge. This ear is in good shape. A lot of deer that you get, unfortunately, have been tagged, then it's later ripped out where they've been in fights or other unforeseen circumstances happened to them. This customer also told me he cut through this ear here. Now, <clears throat> if we did go into it more deeper, but I don't recommend it right now, uh, what I would do, I would actually go ahead and skin this ear out, flip it inside out, split the lips, the nose, and Go ahead and finish fleshing this down. Whenever you skin something, try to skin it as clean as possible. Notice how clean this is. This is pretty clean. Now notice over here. See that meat and the fat? See, we need to take that off. This ain't going to come off with these gloves on. But uh, in the field, you're probably not going to have a pair of these anyway. But uh, if at all possible, get a pair. But notice that though. Try to get that skin as clean as possible, okay? Get this turned inside out like this. Lower lip, upper part of the nose. What you do here, then is cover it with salt. Now, when we're talking about the measurements, <clears throat> a couple inches, two, three inches down from the ears. Let's see how big this deer is going to be. What size form would I order, order in? Now, actually now, I can go ahead and take the measurements now since it's a raw skin or wait until it comes back from our tannery and then take the measurements. Because sometimes we can go ahead and get more of a stretch out of it because again we take it across our machines and we go ahead and we thin out the skin. Now let's just give you an idea the neck circumference of this buck. What size form we can get on. Give it a moderate stretch. We're not going to be stretching a lot. But now watch this. As I stretch this, watch. Notice how this shortens up. Therefore, we need a lot of cape. Now, you can't be unrealistic and stretch it too much. I got a little bit too much here. But uh, you can still get a heck of a good stretch out of it. Now, that's the neck circumference. That's a 23 inch, 23 inch mule deer neck. That's going to take a size 23 inch. Now, on the open market, I'd get a lot of money for this cape if this was mine, between taxidermists, and of course, if it was legal to go ahead and sell it. Some states you got to watch your laws. Some states you can sell. Some states you can't. The way things are going, I don't know what it's going to be like from year to year. But you can see this is a nice, nice mule deer. Nice mule deer. Now. The two measurements, tip of the nose, the corner of the eye, circumference of the neck after it's been skinned. As you can see, this is a big neck deer. And now here, let's go ahead and get rid of this here, this one here. Put this deer cape over here. Now, what I would want to do if I was at home, all right, cover this briefly, already covered it. I'd go ahead, now notice how I'm going to fold this. Now, first of all, before I do this, let's say it was blood soaked up in here. What I would want to do is take cold water, cold water, go ahead and drench it in, in the cold water, stream, pond, lake, what have you. Okay, or obviously if you're at home, fill up the bathtub full of cold water. Your wife really like this, so the rest of your family. Wash that out, okay? Wash that out, get all that blood soakness out of there. Hang it up to dry for about a half hour, 45 minutes, and then take the cape, fold it like this, flesh to flesh, okay, right like this. 
fold in your bottom armpits and stuff, fold it up here, take it, fold it like this, fold it over, and then if you want, since the ears are sticking out, they always seem to be a pain sometimes, fold these in, and then go over like this. Stick it in a plastic bag, squeeze it all the way down, squeeze out all the air, seal it up, and put it in the freezer, in a freezer. Let it freeze rock hard, rock solid, and it will last for a long time until you can take it to the taxidermist. Okay, again, don't salt that, though, if you're going to freeze it. And if you do got it salted, simply wash the salt off. Now, years ago, a lot of people, where'd my saw go? I think it's right behind me. There you go. Helps to know where, where your tools are. Now, years ago, a lot of people would go ahead and just saw off the whole top part. Well, like I said, we have forms today now. They're no longer a flat top form. We have forms today we can buy with preset, pre-molded eye cavities, preset eyes. Oh, it's just fantastic. Uh, uh, the perfect anatomical accuracy that the forms that we have available to us today. And uh, so basically, we're not really too concerned with a whole lot of skull plate. So we're going to make this short, simple, and sweet. Now, the old boys that are still using the old flat top forms, which consequently are going out of production, so I don't know how long they can do this, have got to learn some new techniques. Basically, what we're going to do, we're going to saw down here, right back of the eyes, down about three inches or so, and then saw in the back. Now, be careful that you don't cut the burrs and you don't come up underneath and actually cause the skull plate to split in half. So what we'll do here, we'll go ahead and saw the back first. Come back in here, we'll get it started. It helps to have a partner sometimes to hang on. And if this is an elk, you ain't going to be doing this too awful easy by yourself. You can, I've done it before, but lots of times you can do it. it. always helps to have a friend. Like I said, just take your time. Saw at the angle. Try to get a good grip on it. through there in the back. Again, it's no longer necessary to take that completely across. Now, it's a different story if you want to get a uh, European mount, but we're not going to cover that now. We're covering for a full shoulder head mount. Now, right down here in front, we've cut down. may not have cut enough on this side. What we're going to do is cut it right across here. That's really all the skull plate we need. Now, if these are big, heavy antlers, you might want to uh, have a little bit more of a skull plate to actually hang on to it. <clears throat> what I mean by that is, is simply that uh, these antlers can get heavy if they get big. Anybody can do it. Now, in some states, evidence of sex is required left naturally attached to the animal. So, if you had to go through all this, and you're still out in the bush, keep the sex organs on the animal. There you go. Trim away any meat. Salt this. That's fine. This is a lot easier to pack out than this.